Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is games, the games of international affairs and diplomacy. In an impromptu interview, before he was about to step out onto the ice during the National Hockey League Festival, Russian President Putin was asked about his thoughts on President Trump's firing of FBI Director Comey. Elizabeth Palmer of CBS News asked Putin, who was playing for his home team through a translator, if the firing of Comey would impact the bilateral relations between Russia and the United States. Putin's answer was, quote, we have nothing to do with that, unquote. The Russian leader went on to say, quote, it will not affect Russia-U.S. bilateral relations in any way, unquote. And then, in true Putin form, he continued, don't be angry with me, please, but your question looks silly to me. We have nothing to do with it. President Trump acts within his competence, provided by the Constitution and the law. Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, was the man doing the translating. For his part, Putin, clad in his famous number 11 red jersey with the name Russia emblazoned on the front, went on to score six goals and seven assists for his team. The hockey game took place in Sochi, home of the Winter Olympics. On the ice were several former Olympic and national team members. This was one of those I'm a man moments for Putin. It was the hockey equivalent of his riding bare-chested on horseback or solo in a mini-sub, shooting at bulls, a bullseye, or taking down someone in the judo match. The encounter was amusing and made for an interesting story, but from the perspective of diplomacy and international relations, it was irrelevant. What was essential is that earlier the same day in the White House, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with President Trump. And earlier, the day earlier, Lavrov met with his counterpart, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. Also newsworthy is that Russian media was announcing that Putin and Trump will meet in Hamburg at the G20 meeting scheduled for July. That's really big news. But journalists, even seasoned journalists, need to have some little fun, and so do seasoned diplomats. So when MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell threw out a question about Comey being fired as Lavrov and Tillerson walked out. Together, Lavrov made fun of the entire situation. In a classic movie, he responded, was he fired? You're kidding. You're kidding. In the official press conference with the U.S. Secretary of State, the Russian Foreign Minister, however, had a much more serious tone. And Lavrov said, I can't believe I'm being asked to answer such a question, especially in the United States, where you have a sophisticated democratic political system. We're all adults here. When Lavrov went to the White House to meet with President Trump, he did not go alone. Accompanying him was none other than the now infamous Russian ambassador to the United States, Sergei Kislyak. Kislyak is the person with whom Michael Flynn and Jeff Sessions and a host of other prominent wealthy Americans have met and spent some time. It's because of this meeting with Kislyak, that Flynn is no longer a member of the Trump administration. What most people do not know, even though it's been an open secret for years, is that Kislyak is not merely the present day ambassador. He's a spy master, and recruitment is his greatest skill. Back at his own press conference, Lavrov felt it essential to clear the air about the allegations that Russia has been controlling or even directing United States politics. Lavrov said, it's ridiculous to think a great country like the United States is being controlled by someone else. It is, of course, ironic that these meetings between the President of the United States and Russian diplomats took place the day after President Trump fired FBI Director James Comey. Ambassador Kislyak, laughing and enjoying Trump's company, would be tainted by a touch of irony on any day of the year, let alone that particular day. And the irony continued as later that day, the Dean of Cold War Diplomacy, Henry Kissinger, visited the White House. What is most important here is that Vladimir Putin and his seconds in command are working hard with all the U.S. president's men to mend fences. 
the United States and Russia need to work together to solve some of the big issues confronting not only their own countries, but the world. It is very nice to see, every once in a while, however, that we're able to laugh at ourselves. As the cliche goes, if we don't laugh, we would have to cry. Staying on international affairs, now the Middle East. It would be so much simpler if the conflict in Syria was just between warring Syrian forces fighting on the ground. But no, in this conflict, there are outside non-Syrian powers pulling the strings and controlling the action. Many world powers and wannabe powers have insinuated themselves into the conflict. Chief among them are Iran and Russia on the one side. And on the other side of the divide is Saudi Arabia. Think of them as master puppeteers. And by default, that means that the people of Syria are unwitting marionettes. Dozens of factions are fighting on the ground in Syria. Some support Assad, others want him dead, others want him ousted. Others are fighting in acts of self-preservation, fighting to protect their clans, their families, their property. For the most part, that segment of the fighting population has no political or military point of view. They are motivated by fear and do not care who governs Syria, just as long as they have food to eat and feel safe and protected. When the foreign powers of opposing sides meet, as they often do, we need to pay attention to what they say. We need to analyze what they say in private and what they say in public. We need to analyze their language and their tone. When the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, Adel al-Jubir, met his Russian counterpart, Sergei Levrov, in Moscow, their meeting was more significant than any peace summit and more relevant than any single battle or scrimmage in Syria. Russia and Saudi Arabia are the de facto representatives of the fighting forces on the ground and in the air in Syria. They are the dollars and cents behind every bullet that is fired and every bomb that is detonated. At the conclusion of their meeting, the foreign ministers addressed the press. It was a joint press conference, but the difference in their presentations and points of view were tremendous. Jubir, the Saudi representative, began by saying that Assad has no place in Syria and will play no role in the solution. Levrov, the Russian, responded, saying that the two agree to disagree. He said, quote, we know Saudi Arabia's stance, and it is clear that our approaches to this are not identical, to put it mildly. But we are unanimous that the settlement of the Syrian crisis requires the involvement of all Syrian parties without any exceptions, and of all foreign actors that can exercise influence on the internal parties." Unquote. The Saudi Arabian went on to explain that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization, and that both Hezbollah and Iran must be removed from Syria. He said that Iranian meddling in the Middle East and in the region itself must stop. Lavrov responded saying that, quote, as far as the presence of Iran and Hezbollah in Syria is concerned, you know well we do not consider Hezbollah a terrorist organization, unquote. He went on to say, quote, we proceed from the understanding that both, just as Russia's aerospace group, are in Syria at the invitation of the country's legitimate government, unquote. Saudi Arabia's minister, Al-Jabir, made it very clear that Bashar Assad must be held accountable for the use of poisonous gas against his citizenry. He also insisted that Russia was responsible for constantly violating the ceasefires and holding their feet to the fire, insisting that Russia must play by the rules. Jubir said, the Syrian regime must pay the price of the chemical attack and must prove that it has no chemical weapons. And then he lambasted Hezbollah and Iran saying, we are working to put an end to Iran and Hezbollah's involvement in the region making sure that no one misunderstood the Saudi point of view. Jubair concluded by saying that Assad and Hezbollah must be removed from Syria. He said Bashar al-Assad has no place in Syria's future and Hezbollah has no place anywhere in the world. If this was the tone and the tenor during the press conference, imagine the tensions during their face-to-face -face meeting. Both sides know full well the importance of their roles and the extent of their influence. They also know the power of money and the power of moral support. The complex relationship between Riyadh and Moscow dates to a time way before the Syrian conflict. The relationship is in part colored by OPEC. Saudi Arabia is a member of OPEC. Russia is not. 
Nevertheless, OPEC not only often informs Russia of their intentions, but even solicits their input. OPEC literally asks Russia to go along with the decisions on output. Russia is the first, second, or third largest producer of oil in the world, depending on the moment and on how one counts. Russia is a huge powerhouse in the energy ministry, and OPEC wants them closely aligned and even more working together. So they must be closely aligned, in fact, that OPEC scheduled their meeting in Moscow to discuss production outputs in the days immediately following the Saudi-Russian dialogue I was just speaking about. OPEC wants Russia involvement. And who was the loudest voice in OPEC? Saudi Arabia, of course. Saudi Arabia needs to box out Iran, not only in Syria, but also in OPEC. That's why OPEC and Saudi Arabia are so friendly with Russia. Saudi Arabia clearly sees how cozy Russia is getting with Iran, especially when it comes to Syria and Assad. And if that relationship were to trickle over into other issues, including expanded arms trade and technology, Iran could very well emerge more powerful than ever. And that could impact Syria, Assad, and the entire Middle East. Echoing Saudi Arabia, that is something we do not want to happen. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. Let's just look at one column today. It's a column from the New York Times. And it's by Shmuel Rosner. It was published online on May 12, 2017. The column is entitled, The People versus Haaretz. Shmuel Rosner is the political editor at the Jewish Journal of LA. He's also a senior fellow at the Jewish People Policy Institute and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. A version of this op-ed appeared in print on May 13, 2017, on page 823, which is the opinion page of the New York Times edition, with the headline, The People versus Haaretz. Rosner used to write and edit for Haaretz. This is a scathing critique of the paper, and it's justified. Haaretz has become a paper that rips into Israel and often provides ammunition for Israel's enemies. Rosner shows several examples of columns that are just way beyond the pale of acceptable. This is how he begins. Haaretz is an Israeli paper, admired by many foreigners and few Israelis, loathed by many, mostly Israelis. Read by few, denounced by many. It is a highly ideological, high-quality paper. It has a history of excellence. It has a history of independence. It has a history of counting Israel's mistakes and misbehavior. It has a history of getting on Israel's nerves. A very powerful intro, all true. Rosner now lays out his argument. He illustrates it with a column that, while it should never have been printed, is so typical of many columns in Haaretz. This column suggests, and this is unbelievable, that religious Zionists are worse than Hezbollah terrorists. It's hard to imagine, but yes, that was the entire theme of the column in Haaretz. Rosner writes, consider an incident from mid-April. Haaretz published an op-ed by one of its columnists. It made a less than convincing argument that religious Zionist Israelis are more dangerous to Israel than Hezbollah terrorists. And yet the response was overwhelming. The prime minister, the defense minister, the education minister, the justice minister all denounced the article and the newspaper. The president condemned the article too. The leader of the centrist party, Yesh Atid, called the op-ed anti-Semitic. Leaders of the left center labor party called it hateful. The country was almost unified in condemnation. Rosner then shows other examples, uh, these dealing with Israel's hallowed Memorial Day, a national day of mourning for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for Israel. Listen. One article by a leading columnist explained that he could no longer fly the Israeli flag. Another seemed to be calling for a civil war. These are not exceptions. They are the rule for a newspaper that in recent years has come to rely on provocation. Its provocations aim to serve its ideology. Haaretz and its core readership are fiercely opposed to Israel's occupation of the West Bank, to the government's support for settlers there, to the government's recalibration of the high court, to Israel's state religion status quo, and to other conservative trends. Rosner now explains that Haaretz has simply lost touch with reality and the reality of Israel. He continues, tempting as it is, the story 
of the people versus Haaretz is not a story of a country whose public is no longer willing to tolerate debate. It's a story about a group within Israel that is losing its ability to communicate with the rest of society and have any chance of influencing its future. It's a story about a group within Israel that finds its relief in provoking the rest of us until we snap. And now, Rosner concludes by saying that the paper gets stories correct, but their editorial opinion pages are way off base. He f finishes up by saying, the paper gets many specific stories right, but it gets the larger arc of Israel's story wrong. It tends to paint a bleak picture of Israel's actions, and it goes overboard in predicting grave consequences for Israel that rarely materialize. It tends not to notice that Israel today is a country more powerful militarily, economically, and culturally than it was when the newspaper and its circle of loyal readers began explaining how almost every choice that the country is making is wrong. And maybe that's the source of Haaretz's frustration. It's not that Israel doesn't listen. It's that Israel doesn't listen and still succeeds. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. Let's look at two cartoons today, one from Israel and one from the United Arab Emirates. This first cartoon is by Yaakov Kirshen and Dry Bones, and it's published in the Jerusalem Post, May 5, 2017. It's called Trump's Trip. The idea is to describe Trump's first international trip to the centers of the world's three great religions. The cartoon depicts the Earth, it's thinking and speaking. So the globe is thinking and speaking. It has eyes and a mouth. And on top of the cartoon is the phrase, making the world great again, with a question mark, a play on Trump's great line. The caption on the side reads, quote, on Trump's first official trip abroad, he plans to visit the birthplace of Islam, the birthplace of Judaism, and the Pope in Rome, unquote. At the bottom of the cartoon, it reads the following. It's more than presidential, it's messianic. Dry Bones is being cute, making fun of the religious grandeur of the trip itself. The second cartoon is by Parish Nath and is in Kalij Times. The Kalij Times is in the United Arab Emirates and was published on May 13th, 2017. It's called Global Cyber Attacks. A general is sitting at the desk in the National Security Agency in the United States. A sign says, world safety in our hands. The computer reads, global cyber attacks. And the general shouts, hey, my weapons have been stolen. The cartoon lampoons the cyber attack that hit over 150 countries and that the United States intelligence agencies have said that the hackers used a device that they stole from the US earlier this year. This suggests something huge, but Israel was pretty well insulated against this hack. In a moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Eurovision is an international song competition. Different countries send one representative each, all vying for the title of Eurovision winner. Finals were held in Kiev, Ukraine. The winner was Portugal. Nearly 300 million people watched the event, more than watched the Super Bowl. Israel made it to the finals. Of the 26 finalists, in the end, Israel came out 23rd. Imre Ziv, a 25-year-old performer from Hoda Sharon, represented Israel singing a song in English called I Feel Alive. Over the years, Israel has won the Eurovision three times. They won with performers singing the songs entitled Hallelujah, Abani B, and Diva. One British paper wrongly reported that Israel was pulling out of the competition. That was because IBA News signed off their final on-air broadcast from Eurovision. They assumed that they were leaving Eurovision, not that they were leaving the airwaves. Once upon a time, the music was the centerpiece of the competition at Eurovision. Now it's about the performance. And that means glitz, video, and tech. As Dylan wrote, the times, they are a-changing. Hezbollah is making serious threats. Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah said that in the next conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, it will not just be in Lebanon, but will also be in Israel. According to Nasrallah, Israel is scared and worried of any future confrontation and knows that it could be inside the occupied Palestinian territories. He continued saying, 
there will be no place that is out of reach of the rockets of the resistance or the boots of the resistance fighters. The implication is that Hezbollah rockets will strike Israel at the most populated regions and that fighters will enter Israel. According to intelligence sources, Hezbollah has amassed hundreds of thousands of rockets. Some say over 100,000, some say over 200,000. With that kind of arsenal, Hezbollah can shoot at Israel nonstop and Israel will be hard pressed to defend itself. Iran tested a new torpedo, a high-speed torpedo. The Iranian missile was tested in the Straits of Hormuz, totally within Iranian water. No international protocols were violated. The missile is called the Hoot. It travels 250 miles per hour with a range of up to six miles. The West understandably is worried. They're watching the Hoot very carefully. Remember, one-third of the world's oil travels through the Straits of Hormuz every day. This torpedo test is another example of Iran flexing its muscles in the Straits. The West knows well that they are held captive by Iran in this enormously strategic and essential waterway. Israel has introduced a new police bureau. It's a special investigation and response unit for cyber crimes against minors. This unit will focus on cyberbullying and sexual abuse. The stats on cybercrime in Israel are devastating. One out of every four Israeli children has been subjected to humiliation, shame, and online bullying. One in every five Israeli children have been sexually solicited online. And if that's not enough, one in every 10 Israeli children have been sexually harassed, blackmailed, or had their identities stolen while online. The new unit will have 100 investigators and will have a 24-hour hotline. The minors will be able to call 105 and report an attack, an abuse, or any kind of cyberbullying. This unit has been in planning stages for years, but now it's a reality. It's essential that the cyber crime wave against minors in Israel be brought to an end. It's essential that Israeli police crack down and stop the cyber abuse. The children must be protected. Great Britain arrests a cyber terrorist named Samada Ula. He's 34 years old. Ula was the cyber librarian, one-stop shopping for everything you need as a terrorist. He taught anyone and everyone about missiles, bombs, encryption, and whatever terrorists needed to know. He even hid his material in cufflinks, just like James Bond. Head of the counterterrorism squad in England, Commander Dean Hayden said about Samada Ula, he was an internet terrorist. He had set up a self-help library for terrorists around the world and they were using his library. There was guidance on encryption, ways to avoid detection from police and security services, expert tuition around missile systems, and a vast amount of propaganda. He was self-taught. He has success online and himself and compiled a lot of material and put it into his own library. He's created a one-stop shop for terrorists. He sat in his bedroom in Wales and created online content with the sole intention of aiding people who wanted to actively support ISIS and avoid getting caught by the authorities. This is just the sort of information that may have helped people involved in planning devastating low technical level attacks on crowded places as we have seen in other cities across the world. Samada Ula was arrested in September with the help of the Kenyan police who told British police about him. The information was only been released now. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that Moses is the example of the greatest leader in Jewish tradition? He was the greatest teacher, too. He, we speak about a great deal about politics and leadership on this show. The Jewish leader par excellence is Moses. He judged, taught, led, delegated, inspired. Maimonides, who dies in 1204, derived 13 articles of faith for Judaism. One of them, the seventh article of faith, is that Moses was the greatest prophet and there was none other and no one who came close to him. Moses was able to speak directly to God, not in a dream or in a prophecy. They had a direct line of communication. When we teach leadership, and we talk about leadership, we should remember Moses and the lessons he taught. He made mistakes, but corrected them. 
He was humble. He spoke with a lisp, but he overcame his speech disability. The message was more profound than the medium. His character traits represent the perfect Jewish leader. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.